Everyone, good morning if you're in the Netherlands, good afternoon for those in Saigon or Hanoi uh, in Vietnam. Um, my pleasure to have you again for a weekly briefing about uh, COVID-19 in Vietnam. Um, first off, I would like to especially uh, introduce our guest of today, uh, John Paul Policino from Pfizer Vietnam. John, welcome. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be with you. Fantastic. Yeah, it's uh, very nice. I'm, uh, I'm honored to have you in the show. Um, there's a much ado about uh, vaccine and about the Pfizer Vietnam has been in the news a lot recently. So it's really nice to um, from first hand get, uh, get the information right. Um, the structure of this webinar is actually as such that um, I will speak a bit about the news that's been happening here in, uh, in Vietnam. Um, there's been lots to share, but I'll keep that short. And then I would like to move over to the Q&A with you, uh, John. Um, of course, I've prepared a set of questions. There's, uh, there have been a few recent developments that I would like to, uh, to hear your thoughts about. Um, and if you are listening in and you want to participate, may I suggest that you um, share a, a message in the chat box and we'll get to that question. Uh, usually the session takes between 30 minutes and 45 minutes, um, so that, that, that should be plenty and that should be the time in which we can uh, ask our questions to you, uh, John. Okay, um, let's see. So there has been a lot happening this week, uh, an incredible amount of news. Uh, I think the general view has actually um, uh, changed uh, a lot over the weekend with even uh, the military soldiers entering the city, people reacting quite shocked to that. Uh, perhaps the, the, the social communications of the Vietnamese government has might have uh, left to be desired in that uh, regard. Um, uh, and whether that is uh, a good thing or a bad thing is still up in the air, if you ask, uh, ask me. Basically, no one has no one is allowed to leave their home or leave their compound. Uh, the military is delivering food to uh, a set of areas in uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and to make matters even more dramatic, there has been a sudden change of leadership. So uh, Wen Tan Fong, the chairman of the People Committee, has been replaced in a um, yeah in a rather surprising move to do that. Uh, amidst the crisis um, and also there it has to be evaluated afterwards if that has been a good move or not. So it has been so much news that it's almost impossible to reproduce that and I think the newsletter that we sent out yesterday is a better platform to completely go through things. Also it's not really my <clears throat> uh, idea in this webinar to, to share my opinion, it's more a statement of uh, facts. Um, Everything that has been going on has also had its effect on uh, the Dutch Business Association that uh, I am the director of. What we do is we offer an entry permit service for, um, for our members, but also for friends of the association, uh, where we help them with their traveling documents into Vietnam. And because of the recent developments, we've had to also uh, uh, tell to our customers that another delay of about two weeks can be expected because the people committees are very understaffed. There are usually only one or two representatives per uh, district committee uh, available, and they will only um, uh, engage in the most urgent cases uh, for which is very difficult to qualify. Uh, so that is something that we have communicated that uh, in terms of the, the, the timings, we should expect further and further uh, delays, which is obviously very concerning uh, and detrimental for people's uh, travel plans. Um, however, it is something that we have to live with and uh, we have to try and balance out every day and try to find new solutions for it. Before we get to the interview with, uh, with John and, uh, and also hopefully a lot of uh, your questions, I would like to raise that DBAV fully endorses the Eurocham CSR campaign. Um, and that is, an, uh, I think, an important uh, point that Eurocham has uh, launched a, a CSR campaign where every chamber is asked to cooperate and every member is asked to 
come along. And the reason why I think it's particularly interesting is because Eurochem made it incredibly easy to donate with a few options, for example, to which hospital and for example, to which, uh, 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 what kind of medical equipment you, uh, uh, you desire to, to donate. And then within a few days, or at least within a very reasonable time frame, that will be um, uh, de delivered to that said hospital. Um, so therefore, only for that reason, it is already a very good idea to donate as a company to, um, uh, to Eurocham. And besides, if you are donating, and specifically if you're a Dutch business and if you are donating, then let us know about your initiative uh, so that we can further help you to amplify your message. Um, well, these are all things that are in the member-only newsletter of the DBAV. Uh, so if you want to learn more about what DBAV does and what our endorsements are, then uh, just uh, don't hesitate to send me an email, which I will put in the chat in a minute. Okay, so I think that is a, a, a reasonable display in five minutes of what has been going on. Um, John, over to you. Uh, welcome again. I noticed a post on LinkedIn from your site this morning. Can you let us know what you shared? Of course. And, and firstly, Guido, I want to say a big uh, thank you to yourself and DBVA for the invitation uh, to join you today. I know that um, uh, we're all, uh, particularly those of us uh, in Vietnam and in Ho Chi Minh, experiencing a very uh, both personally and, and professionally for our businesses. So uh, it's it's my absolute pleasure to be with you to, to discuss uh, some of the topics uh, today. So um, what we what we were very happy to announce um, uh, earlier today was that uh, Pfizer has been able to reach uh, an additional uh, agreement, an addendum uh, uh, to our original supply agreement for an in incremental 20 million doses of Pfizer BioNTech uh, COVID-19 vaccine for Vietnam. So. Um, many of you will know that we had an original agreement uh, that was signed on the 7th of June for 31 million doses. Uh, we started shipping um, uh, exactly one month to the day after um, that agreement was signed, uh, and we've been delivering every week since. Um, uh, so now we have a, a full uh, 2021 agreement covering 51 million doses, uh, and those 51 million doses will be delivered uh, within this year. So. Um, I can discuss further uh, the broader context of where we are uh, as a nation uh, in terms of over, overall vaccine uh, procurement, um, which I think is a critical um, discussion point uh, as of now, but I'm very happy to, to share that uh, Vietnam continues to, to uh, move uh, ahead uh, in a fairly aggressive way uh, to secure as much vaccine supply as they can as soon as possible. Okay, that's good to hear. That's slightly uh, reassuring. Uh, because obviously the, the delivery schedules that we started with um, are, were um, not or only in part uh, met, at least that's what I understood. Can you elaborate, elaborate a bit on what the current delivery schedule of Pfizer to Vietnam is, please? Yeah, so, so our current um, schedule for, for Vietnam is we're, we're expecting uh, 5.4 million doses uh, uh, between our, the start of our agreement and the end of uh, September. So we will have an additional 3.7 million doses uh, in September at this stage. Um, this, um, uh, this supply shifts on a rolling weekly and monthly basis based on um, a supply allocation around the, the globe. Um, and we're working very hard to accelerate that. So you will have seen that um, uh, Prime Minister Pham Minh Chin had a, a conversation with our global CEO last Friday. He's reached out to um, the CEO of AstraZeneca and uh, they really are doing all they can to, to accelerate uh, supply. So um, we are supplying as much as we can, as, as quickly as we can uh, to Vietnam. Um, uh, we have a, a fairly large um, uh, allocation coming in uh, the fourth uh, quarter. I think the, the clear message and challenge that we see uh, for Vietnam really is for the remainder of this month and next month. Um, uh, the next two months are, are, are clearly uh, the, the challenging time, but we've also seen updates that, um, uh, that we expect a total, uh, not just of Pfizer vaccine, but of, of all uh, suppliers um, uh, uh, to reach about 20 million doses this month and next month uh, combined. The good news is that you know that's 
comparatively very good uh, versus um, other markets at this time. I think Vietnam's done a very good job of, um, of vaccine diplomacy um, and seeking government to government donation. We've seen uh, um, any number of doses now, 5 million Moderna doses through USG donation, a number of Astra doses through uh, Japan and UK. We've seen EU nations um, uh, uh, donating as well. We saw the most recent one of half a million doses from Poland. So I think the, the good thing that we're seeing is this vaccine diplomacy of government to government donation will help bridge the gap, if you like, between now and, and the fourth quarter. Uh, but my, my sense is by the fourth quarter, we're going to see a significant volume uh, of vaccine um, uh, arriving uh, in Vietnam. The other, the other cautiously optimistic message that I think um, I'd share is um, that we have seen uh, uh, Vietnam able to um, mirror uh, the arrival of vaccine, uh, the administration of vaccine. This was a, a, a concern to be, uh, to be transparent, I think. We've never seen an administration of a, a vaccine campaign of this scale globally, uh, let alone in, in Vietnam. Uh, and we have seen um, uh, through you know, concerted efforts, and uh, I know that there were some, some um, uh, growing pains through the early stages, but we have seen a fairly close relationship between the delivery of uh, vaccines and the administration uh, of vaccines, which is a, a very uh, promising sign. Okay, so that means that it seems uh, controlled in uh, in your eyes, you you see that that the vaccines are actually administered properly and therefore inoculated properly. Correct, correct. Yeah, and and I think the other point there, Guido, is we've seen them do a, a fairly good job of how they've allocated that vaccine supply to the areas that um, are needed uh, the most. So we saw um, we saw um, not too not too long ago decision 3355 which uh, focused on the prioritization of, of uh, vaccine across uh, patient populations um, it seems clear in that uh, prioritization that there's both a, a clear health and economic um, uh, focus uh, because they're also focused on uh, on businesses particularly manufacturers um, uh, and they've also been very focused on ensuring supply gets to, to um, Ho Chi Minh City, which you know, up until uh, now has is, is proven to be really the epicenter of, of, um, uh, of where this outbreak uh, currently is. And if we look at um, data from the MOH, we can see that um, the vaccination rates in Ho Chi Minh uh, City are far outstripping uh, that of other parts of the country with um, with uh, about 79% uh, of the yeah. Ho Chi Minh City population receiving their first dose already. So I that's think right. that's, that's a good the sign. The problem obviously in Ho Chi Minh is that the vaccination rate and specifically in Vietnam has uh, slowed down tremendously um, due to the, 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 the lack of supply. It's very difficult to run a mass vaccination campaign if the supply slows down. And like your earlier comment, like you already said, like this month and the next month will be the absolute bottleneck. Um, so. If that is the absolute bottleneck, then can you maybe let us uh, shine your light on what do you think in general are the consequences for the for the business community and what should uh, uh, general managers and uh, 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 prepare for? Yeah, so I think the I think the you know every cloud is a silver lining, but you know before you get to the silver lining, you have to get through the the storm, right? So I think the. Um, <laughs> The, the, the challenge really is going to be over the next, um, uh, the next six weeks um, or so, uh, and then as we get into to October. So I do think that we need to be well planned for um, uh, uh, ongoing uh, uncertainty and disruption uh, over the next uh, couple of months. Um, I am glad to see that up till now, we've seen about 17, 18 million doses of vaccine arrive in Vietnam. As I said, we've got 20 million doses coming between uh, August and September. Uh, and then from October onwards, um, at, at least I know from a, a, a Pfizer supply uh, perspective, the, the uh, supply will, will, will move into close to double digit uh, millions um, per month. So we're, we're literally going to have a huge um, uh, uh, upkick in uh, vaccine supply come uh, October. So really, I think businesses need to steal themselves for the next uh, couple of months. Um, we, um, we watch just as much as uh, everybody else does what's happening in, in Ho Chi Minh City. 
uh, particularly um, in terms of uh, the government uh, measures to contain uh, the virus. I think it's going to be continually challenging to, to operate and to, to move uh, around. Um, but I do think that the, the, the signals that we've seen in terms of vaccine prioritisation um, and what they're doing to support uh, Ho Chi Minh City uh, is, is a positive signal. Uh, and the fact that vaccine diplomacy, what they've been able to secure in terms of supply for the next couple of months uh, is, a, is a strong step uh, in the right uh, direction to get us back on track as quickly as possible. Right. So cautiously optimistic story. Um, what I'm sensing in your story is that this there is light at the end of the tunnel and we are going to get through this. Um, uh, the question then that a lot of managers have and that they need to report back to their home countries about is when is that going to happen? Right. So, for example, if you are, let's say, for example, let's start with a Horeca entrepreneur. Let's say you have a, a restaurant for two years in, uh, in Ho Chi Minh City. When, when do you reckon, uh, can you comment on when do you think they can accept guests again in a, a cautiously? So Guido, I mean, this is a, one of those crystal ball questions, right? And it's a, a very, very difficult thing to, um, uh, to predict. I mean, we, we know that the, the government's ambition, again, stated within decision 3355 is to hit 70% uh, of the population being um, vaccinated uh, with two doses, those over the age of 18 by April uh, of next yeah. year, 50% um, yeah. by the end of, of this year. I think it's an ambitious um, target, um, uh, but an important one to, to shoot for. Um, I, think, um, I think we definitely want to see, uh, particularly uh, places like Ho Chi Minh or, or other large, largely affected places, getting towards that 70%, um, 70 to 80% uh, fully vaccinated uh, point um, to, to reach herd immunity before things will start to, to really um, uh, normalize. Um, and, and then there's a, a number of other unknowns, right? There's unknowns around you know, uh, the duration of immunogenicity, what's happening with the Delta variant, um, yep. what the risk of um, um, uh, additional variants that we haven't seen uh, come up yet uh, come in. So um, I do think that uh, it's a very difficult one to predict and I'd, I'd hate to, to speculate um, uh, uh, with so many uh, unknowns. I think the, the only certainty is uh, that we're in a state of uncertainty. Um, but I would, I would uh, hope to see um, by the latter part of this year, us starting to, to really um, bend the curve and, and get on top of this from a vaccination point of view and a, and a control uh, point of view. Yeah. Uh, but what that means in terms of uh, the impact on uh, social distancing and, and uh, business operations is, is a very difficult one uh, to predict. So summarizing what you're saying is, it's too difficult to predict right now when, for example, a restaurant uh, can reopen again in whatever kind of form, right? Correct, correct. Okay, yeah. I understand. Um, another thing that you mentioned is indeed um, uh, had the, the immunology uh, side of things. Uh, and one thing that I'm, I'm, for example, me, I'm currently in the Netherlands right now, is that they're, they're speaking of a third vaccine, a booster vaccine to, uh, to keep up the, the, the immune reaction or so. Um, and my question is, could it be that a third booster vaccine for Western countries Mean, means further delay for the vaccine supply in Vietnam? So it's, it's a good question. I think um, what, we're, what we're really seeing is you know, a, a, a compounding effect in terms of our ability to supply vaccine around the world. Just to give you a sense, from a, uh, from a Pfizer perspective, prior to COVID, our annual largest volume of vaccines supplied across all the vaccines that we produce is 200 million doses in one year. In the first six months of this year, we have produced and supplied over a billion doses. And for the full year of 2021, we are estimating we'll deliver 3 billion doses. So between the first half and the second half of 2021, there will be another doubling um, uh, of supply, and that's just us, right? And then we have all the other manufacturers that are scaling supply uh, at the same time. Um, that's the first point. The second point is we've also made it very clear through our uh, partnership with the COVAX facility, uh, with our partnership with the US government through um, uh, the donation of, of um, half a billion uh, uh, doses that they're working on, 
uh, that uh, equitable access uh, to vaccine is a critical uh, point. Uh, and, and we've seen um, uh, developed countries also flag this point, right? It, we, reach a, we reach a stage where vaccinating uh, the developed world doesn't solve things for the developed world either, right? Because we live in a global uh, world, we live in a global uh, economy. So um, uh, uh, equitable access remains a, a critical uh, part of our focus. Uh, and uh, this is also why we're seeing uh, agreements like we've um, been able to achieve in, in Vietnam. You know, 51 million doses uh, in Vietnam is a significant uh, volume. Um, uh, and we're seeing that happen uh, right across uh, emerging markets. So um, I, I don't necessarily think uh, the, the potential emergence and need for a booster dose is going to, to affect that. I think there will always be an, a, an, a significant concerted effort to ensure equitable access uh, and, and supply. Um, uh, and, and hopefully by the time the, the requirement uh, of a booster dose is known and confirmed, we'll continue to also see a scaling of um, a vaccine production uh, around the yeah. world. So um, it does create some complexity, but I think it's something that can be addressed. Yeah. So in summary, you're saying that you've tremendously skilled up vaccine uh, uh, production um, and that um, as such, yeah, there is more possible in terms of global vaccinations also for a third shot. Um, you're also mentioning that the, uh, the third shot can add some extra complexity to other delivery schedules that you think it can be addressed. And you, uh, the question you raise is whether the developed world has actually helped with the third booster shot and if that not should be uh, delivered to countries where a first shot has not been uh, inoculated yet, right? Yeah, and and Guido, I mean, I think we're still we're still not at the stage where we've um, uh, gained approval for booster shots in the vast majority of the world. Of the world. So while while we're anticipating that that the need may likely uh, emerge, um, that's not uh, absolutely uh, confirmed uh, at this point. Uh, nor nor do we know if a uh, 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 another variant um, comes that may require a, a, an alternate uh, vaccine. So uh, there's there's still still a lot uh, to to um, to solve for, I think. Um, but like I said, I think right now we're really focused on ensuring uh, equitable uh, access. And I think the the other the I mean these are really complex issues, right? Because it's not just about how uh, vaccines are supplied uh, around the world, but it's also about how they're managed. On the ground and administered yeah. within countries, Definitely. and um, that, that's another uh, challenging dynamic because even in some cases where we can get um, supply uh, uh, to developing countries, uh, we're we're seeing a need to really support and invest in logistics and administration to make sure that they can get into the arms mm -hmm. of of patients. Right, so uh, there's many mm -hmm. factors that need to be be considered, but um, I, I can't say enough how squarely focused on equitable uh, access we are. Okay. Yeah. OK, um, I've got a few uh, more questions before we move to the questions from the crowd. So um, uh, thanks for elaborating on that it was a very uh, useful add on. Uh, another problem that I've heard frequently about is uh, the lack of uh, storage supply uh, in some countries or uh, bad logistics. What is your current uh, you you already mentioned something earlier on, but what is your current assessment of the uh, logistics in Vietnam are, for example, big delays to be expected when we try to ship uh, vaccines to rural areas in Vietnam? So the, so the provincial side of it, I think, is um, still uh, to be seen. Um, so far, so good, uh, I think, is, is the fair comment. We, we've seen uh, reasonably good uh, um, practices in being able to distribute across uh, the country. Uh, good practices in terms of, of storage. We support, uh, as Pfizer, uh, last mile delivery uh, within um, uh, Vietnam as well uh, to points of use or points of, of uh, delivery uh, as stipulated by the Ministry of Health and, and Nihe. Um, so that, that so far has been working um, very well. Um, we're also um, uh, confident in the ability to store uh, vaccine at ultra low temperature uh, as required. And we've, we've seen um, uh, the, um, the procurement of ultra low temperature freezers uh, around the country. We saw a very large uh, donation announced by the Department of Defense in the US uh, to Vietnam of 77 ultra low temperature freezers, including one for each province. 
Uh, so, you know, the, a lot of that support and infrastructure is being uh, built and established over time. Um, uh, and uh, so, so generally, um, the short answer is, we're, we're um, optimistic and confident that distribution and storage can be managed. And we've also uh, grown in confidence in terms of Vietnam's ability to administer at a rate commensurate with the supply that's coming in. You know, we've seen uh, daily highs of you know, 1.4 million doses administered mm -hmm. in a day. You know, and if we can reach that point and we can exceed that point and sustain uh, that uh, over time, uh, then, uh, then we're in uh, generally good shape. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks. You just mentioned a U.S. donation, um, and that is actually my, my, my last question. Today is actually the, the visit of the vice president of uh, the USA, Kamala Harris, to Vietnam. It's her first day of two days. Um, what do you expect of that? Are, are further donations from the USA to Vietnam to be expected, you reckon? Uh, so, so I think that's something that we need to... to leave uh, to see um, what, what is shared over the, the visit from Vice uh, President uh, Harris. Um, obviously, the, the visit is a much broader uh, visit in terms of its context um, uh, for Vietnam within the Southeast Asia region, uh, what's happening within the region, what's happening in terms of building uh, broader trade and collaboration between the US and Vietnam and Southeast uh, Asia. So I think, the, uh, I think that visit is clearly much broader in scope than um, uh, than um, what we're discussing uh, here today. Um, I'll be watching uh, just as much as um, uh, e each of you to see uh, what happens over the next uh, uh, couple of days um, uh, with, uh, with uh, a very watchful eye. Yeah, okay, okay. Um, so we'll see what happens uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. Um, last question from my side is, what do you think the private sector in Vietnam can do? Because what we have tried to do, for example, through Eurojam, is to procure vaccines. Um, well, we, we've basically been told no, uh, first off by the manufacturers, then also the Vietnam government was in the way. Um, what are the other options we have, in your opinion, to contribute to, uh, to expedite an end of this crisis? So th this is a good question, Guido. I mean, let me first address the, the complexity on uh, uh, private procurement first, because I think there's a lot of questions and um, uh, perhaps misinformation um, about uh, private vaccine procurement. So uh, as of today, uh, Pfizer, along with many multi multinationals, are not um, uh, 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 privately uh, distributing uh, vaccine for a, a range uh, of reasons. All of, all of our vaccine supply to date is going through bilateral agreements with governments, uh, through the COVAX uh, facility, all being supplied through government to government uh, donations. The main reason for that being um, linked to our equitable access uh, principle, because um, you know, in, in markets like Vietnam, we supply at a not-for-profit price, um, and we want to make sure that that not-for-profit price is um, carried through by the government, uh, and then the, the supply of the vaccine is actually going um, uh, to follow uh, uh, patient prioritization as outlined by the government and less to do with who is able to pay, willing to pay, um, uh, et cetera. The other, the other challenge with, with that is when we have a, a, such a drastic situation of uh, demand so significantly outstripping uh, supply, uh, as soon as we uh, entertain one private procurement uh, arrangement, uh, we really sort of open Pandora's box to having to, to entertain no many uh, private um, uh, procurement arrangements, which is completely unfeasible to, to, to manage uh, equitably at this time uh, as well. There are other downstream uh, risks associated with it as well in terms of uh, fraudulent, fraudulent actors and, and compliance and patient safety, et cetera, in terms of how it's supplied and distributed. So I just wanna make those comments that, you know, this is not an easy decision. It's not something that's made uh, lightly, but there is um, um, a method to the, to the madness in terms of why those uh, difficult decisions are being made. The, the second part of your question, Guido, is a very good one. Uh, what, what, what else can we do to support um, uh, uh, the, the current situation? I've been very happy to see that the private sector has been engaged in terms of um, uh, wider support, logistics, administration uh, of, of, vac of vaccination. Um, uh, so uh, that, that's a, a huge step. So any, any um, business that's in and around the healthcare uh, sector, I think, has a very clear and active role to play 
anyone that's involved in um, uh, in logistics may also be able to support. Uh, and then there's and then there's additional support that goes beyond um, uh, the direct health related uh, support uh, and starts to branch into humanitarian uh, aid as well. So um, any any support that can be offered that centers around uh, the humanitarian need, I think, is also uh, uh, something that we can all uh, play an active uh, role in uh, today. So uh, I'd be looking at sort of those two two uh, aspects. If you have a a business that centers around a, a skill set that can support um, healthcare and vaccination, um, or uh, that has a, a capacity to support in humanitarian humanitarian aid, I think that's the that's the areas that will really make a difference to Vietnam today. Yeah. Understood. Yeah, and in that light, I think, for example, the there is uh, almost an as urgent need for medical equipment uh, into Vietnam, exactly which right. is not surrounded by as many complexities as um, as vaccination. So for DBAV side, and I know that from another from a number of Dutch companies, that is what they currently uh, have shifted their focus uh, towards, and. Um, uh, also, the Eurojam initiative, which makes it easy, uh, low risk, and uh, had no liabilities uh, to, to to donate money for for immediate uh, relief to the Vietnamese, is I think a very uh, good initiative. Um, there are a few questions in chat that I let me see um, uh, from Drew Harkness. He says a question to clarify: twenty million total doses to arrive in August and September. Um, so what is the total of how many doses in Vietnam before before the fourth quarter? So this is a good question. So it depends on, on the data that you look at, right? So we know that we have about um, uh, nearly 18, 19 million to date, um, yep. uh, and then 20 million across uh, August uh, and um, uh, September. Um, I'm not sure how much of that 20 million sits in October. So it would be an estimation of uh, between um, uh, 30 and, and 40 uh, million, right? It's probably closer to, to 30 million would be my estimation. And then uh, the rest would come uh, in into the fourth quarter. And the, okay. and the, and the, and the, yeah. good, and the good news is from a, a total uh, vaccine procurement perspective, uh, in February this year, the government announced Resolution 21, where they want, where they publicly stated they wanted to procure 150 million doses uh, from different sources. Um, based on on our assessment of all the agreements that the government of Vietnam has reached, they are somewhere between 130 and 150 million uh, doses already uh, secured. So they've done an incredible job of of um, getting. Uh, access to a supply volume that you know really does get us towards the potential for herd immunity. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that 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 uh, shines some light on that matter. A question from Thomas Snook, also a DBAV member from CMIT, is: We see, for example, um, uh, Israel having many cases as well, despite nearly seventy percent of vaccination. Is Pfizer updating its vaccine to the latest Delta variant, and when is that? And if so, when is that expected upgraded version expected to be released? So as of, as of now, our data um, uh, versus the Delta variant remains very positive um, with um, uh, efficacy rates close to 80% um, still. Um, I think, so at this point, uh, where I don't believe the, the expectation is to create a new vaccine for the Delta variant. Um, I think the I think the the challenge really uh, that we're seeing around the globe is is twofold. One, we do still see um, reasonably large um, unvaccinated populations, and and typically they they um, they centre uh, together uh, geographically within uh, countries, which creates uh, complexity in certain uh, regions. Um, I think it's also clear that we're seeing um, uh, data that immunogenicity can reduce and that's uh, largely related to two points the reduction in immunogenicity over time is a natural um, uh, uh, phenomenon you know the number of antibodies um, that that the, uh, that the body creates post vaccination will decline uh, it is a question of time and then uh, the delta variant uh, is compounding that issue because it, it does um, uh, it's a, a very clever virus that finds its way around uh, the vaccine in more cases than than previous uh, variants. 
so at this point, uh, the short answer is we're not looking at an upgraded version um, uh, because we believe the current uh, vaccine is still um, uh, very efficacious. There is two questions. One, a question of do we require a booster um, to maintain a higher level of immunogenicity uh, over time? Uh, and then the second question is, if we do see an alternate var variant, um, how quickly do we need to look at a, a, a different vaccine? And given the technology that we have with the mRNA uh, vaccines, we believe that we can um, uh, develop uh, and produce a new vaccine within 100 days. So um, I think there is hope in, in that ability to, to um, manage new variants uh, if required. Um, but at this point, um, uh, I don't believe we're, we're looking at a new vaccine uh, for Delta. Most of, the, most of the outbreaks that we're seeing are typically in unvaccinated populations. Yeah. And the, from my understanding is that vaccinate, vaccinated people will always be better protected. But for example, in a country like Israel, there are many more vaccinated people than unvaccinated people. And as such, it is not strange that the number of vaccinated people uh, that still contract the disease is now going up uh, in numbers higher because there are so many more vaccinated people, right? Correct, correct. And I think the other important point is it's not just whether people are contracting um, COVID, but also the severity of, of, um, of the disease and the burden of the disease and the, the rate of hospitalization of, of, um, uh, of, of those vaccinated versus unvaccinated is night and day really. So, you know, the, yeah. the overall burden of disease, the impact on the healthcare system is significantly reduced in vaccinated populations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, question from Drew is more in a general manner. Is it, for example, I did get an AstraZeneca at first in Vietnam, then I got uh, Pfizer as a second. Is it possible that there will be more mixing and matching with other brands? So the mixing and matching we've seen uh, or com different combinations of vaccine we've seen um, in different countries around the world. Um, I, I think it's it's natural for us to, to see this and expect this. I mean, from a from a Pfizer perspective, I do need to to um, uh, to say that you know this is not well researched and is outside of our approved uh, label, uh, and it's outside of the the wealth of of um, existing uh, clinical evidence. So we've done large um, scale phase three studies, and the vast majority of the uh, significant volume of vaccine that's been supplied around the world has followed our label of of um, uh, Pfizer followed by Pfizer twenty one days later. Um, as, as we have seen for, for other uh, manufacturers. So uh, there is small um, uh, uh, series of evidence um, looking at combined different um, vaccines. And as I, as I said, we are seeing this come up uh, in different countries around the world. Um, but uh, it's difficult for me to comment on um, whether we'll see it. And, and we certainly can't support it at this point because we need to follow our label and we need to follow um, uh, the science. Um, ultimately, it becomes a, a choice of the health authorities uh, around the world, including in Vietnam, if they uh, feel the, the, the need and benefit to, to, to go down that path. We always suggest in, in that context that if we are going to see um, a combined uh, vaccine uh, use, it'd be great if we could collect uh, data on it because we'd love to be able to see that data published uh, so that we know globally, you know, what the implications of, of, of this um, uh, type of practice uh, would be. Um, so I think that's the, the comment that I'd say. I think we are seeing it in, in a number of countries, including developed countries like the UK. Um, uh, so uh, I think we will continue to see more of this. Yeah, understood. Okay, well, thanks, John. Um, first off, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, being here with us and, uh, and for all your input. Um, congratulations on the 20 million uh, Pfizer doses. That must be nice, a nice, uh, nice moment, nice announcement. So that's fantastic. I'm hearing generally, um, uh, hey, your story is very serious. You're cautiously optimistic. I understand from your story that everything considered, you are expecting that Vietnam will turn one of the corners by quarter four, 2021. So that's this year. 
that's cautiously optimistic. I'm uh, uh, I'm hearing that that hey, we are uh, that you are also optimistic about the delivery and then the acceptance and the administration, the inoculation of the vaccine is one of the has proven to be one of the strong points of Vietnam. So there's very little spillage. That's what I understood. And the challenge is in the coming, the real challenge, the real bottleneck is in the coming six weeks. So 17 to 18 million doses will arrive in, uh, uh, in Vietnam in the coming six weeks. Is that correct? And well, 20 million across August and September. Um, right. And, and we've seen already about 18 million uh, to date. Right. Sorry. So, yeah, exactly. So that will be about doubled. That will be the challenge to keep up the mass, mass vaccination, to keep on jabbing. Uh, and, and from October onwards, we'll see more relief and a move of the campaign into the province, into the more rural areas. Correct, correct. I think, I think, that's, a, I think that's a good summation. And, and Guido, I just saw a, another question in the chat around um, uh, children. I'm happy to, to address that. So just, uh, just so everybody knows, our, uh, our Pfizer vaccine was uh, originally approved uh, under emergency use in Vietnam for children over 12 years of age. In fact, the, the request for the additional 20 million uh, doses was given to us in the context of supporting supply for um, children uh, above the age uh, of 12. Um, we also have um, uh, studies uh, ongoing for children above the age of five years, uh, so five to, to 12, and uh, another study for children over the age of six months. Um, we're, we're anticipating those studies will be ready by the end of uh, the year. We're also looking at other data around, uh, obviously, the variants, um, uh, uh, use in pregnant women, et cetera. So, you know, we continue to examine uh, all of this, but, um, uh, but uh, m my hope is that um, uh, with this additional 20 million doses, we'll start to see uh, the Ministry of Health open access to um, that next age group down of, of um, children above the, um, above the age of 12, and then potentially um, uh, younger age groups uh, uh, in, in due course once the, the data is available. Uh, but otherwise, Guido, I think you summed things up um, really nicely. I think you know, we, we do need to batten down the hatches um, over the next uh, six to eight weeks uh, or so. It's certainly not going to be an, an, an easy uh, period for, for, for any of us. Uh, cautiously optimistic is uh, the right uh, uh, tone, uh, despite the significant degree of uncertainty. Um, I, I think we have reason to, to, to believe that Vietnam will find uh, a way uh, forward, uh, despite the complexity. Um, and you know, if if um, not too much else uh, changes, uh, hopefully by by the end of the year we'll be in a, a much better uh, position than we find ourselves in uh, today. Um, and pleasure to be with you and, and hope to continue the conversation. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. I hope to have you one of the coming weeks or in the coming months if uh, if there are big occurrences that uh, occur or that need uh, some expert comment. Um, so thanks for attending, John, um, about uh, the DBAV and about this, this program. Eh? So what we do is basically this is a weekly journal. Um, what I try to do is on a weekly basis, I invite uh, experts such as John. Uh, next week, uh, it will be uh, Gabor, Gabor Fluit, that uh, uh, most Dutchies, uh, is, a, is a person that most Dutch people, Dutch citizens in Vietnam know very well. Uh, Gabor is the CEO of uh, the Heus uh, in the whole Asia group, can also shine his light on what the business outlook means for his business that heavily relies on uh, supply chains and, um, and such. Next to his job uh, as CEO, he is also vice chairman of the Eurocham uh, uh, Executive Committee and as such a very frequent dialogue partner with the Vietnamese government. Um, so insofar as you are looking for, for information, I think the DBAV newsletter covers quite much. We have uh, sort of a wrap up. It's not too much work for me either because I just wrap things up. The Vietnam Weekly for Michael Tataski is a good summary of all the things that are happening. The WHO reports are in there, uh, embassy information from the Dutch are in there. Um, if you are thinking about going back to the Netherlands and flying back into Vietnam or Australia for that matter or any country in the world, then we do provide a service which helps you with your uh, traveling documents. Right now, that service is temporarily uh, paused. We expect a delay of um, 
nothing moving, everything's paralyzed for about two weeks. That's what the expectation is, but we still offer uh, the service after that. So if you are contemplating about going back to the Netherlands and you want to get more information then just um, uh, let me know and uh, I can share more information with you. If you want us to really uh, uh, run the errands for you, then sure, we can help with that. And that comes with uh, a member price or a non-member price. Um, okay, that's that. Thanks very much again, John. Thanks to all for, for watching, all 40 uh, participants. And uh, I hope to, uh, to see you next week in next week's webinar. Fantastic. Bye -bye. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks so much. Bye, John. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.